Today's episode is going to be a prepeat episode, just like the one we did on policing. This is a prepeat of Aiden Balu's work, Christian Non Resistance in All Its Important Bearings. Specifically, it will be from chapter seven, his final chapter in the book. We will be doing this uh, this episode. We're actually going to go through his whole book um, in in the next season, our great work season. And I highly recommend Aiden Balu's work. It's it's fantastic. the The most comprehensive uh, and and most jam packed case for um, Christian nonviolence. But also, what you find from Balu is that, like a lot of other pacifists in uh, in the nineteenth century, in particular, he was an abolitionist, but he was also uh, what I would deem a a Christian anarchist. He was um, wholeheartedly against government as it as it stands anyway. And in, in this chapter, Balu is going to make his argument against um, a government. Now, if you're, if you're a Christian who believes in nonviolence, I think Balu's argument is 100% irrefutable. I mean, um, he, he's going to show you very clearly that if you hold a non-resistance, you, you can't participate in, in our government. But even if you're not a Christian, um, depending on what, what your moral ethics are, I think Balu points out how uh, being a part of the state, as we have it, as our constitution is written and, and all that, being a part of the state is going to make you complicit with what the state does, at least as far as, as uh, is constitutionally permissible. And Balu is going to get in to why internal reform is problematic because to uh, to create internal reform, you have to first agree to um, to the legitimacy of what evil the state is is currently doing. That's constitutional. So hopefully um, you enjoy this uh, as a foretaste of of Balu's whole work and um, and enjoy. back to the fourth way podcast today we are going to finish up our book by aiden balu called christian non-resistance in all its important bearings this will be the last chapter chapter seven of his work chapter seven non-resistance in relation to government is non-resistance for or against human government I propose to occupy the present chapter in treating on the relation of non-resistance to human government. Is non-resistance, as defined and expounded in this work, for or against human government per se? This depends on what sense is given to the adjective human when joined to the noun government. If human government be understood to imply or presuppose an inherent, original, absolute power in man to make laws and exercise discretionary control over man, non-resistance is against it. It denies any such inherent, original, absolute power in man and refers it to only God. In this sense, all rightful government is essentially divine, man being ever a subject, not a governor, and whenever he assumes to require anything repugnant to the divine law, He is a rebel against God and a usurper over his co-equal fellow man. Man cannot rightfully legislate or govern insubordinately to his creator. He can only govern under and with the divine sanction. If this position needs any defense, non-resistants are prepared to maintain it against the world. None, however, but atheists and would-be deicides, the genuine, No governmentalist can be reckless enough to controvert it. But if human government be understood to imply only divine government, clothed in human forms, and administered by human organizations with merely incidental human imperfections, non-resistance is for it, per se. 
It has no necessary opposition to it whatever. It recognizes man as by nature a social being. It sees the ties and dependencies of husband and wife, parent and child, friend and neighbor, smaller and larger community, and is essentially friendly to all social organizations founded on love to God and man. Human government, in this sense, would be an organization of society, constitutionally deferential to the highest known law of God. It would disclaim and denounce all assumption of power to set up and enforce any law, regulation, or usage in violation of the natural equality and brotherhood of mankind. It would inscribe on its main pillars no resistance of injury with injury, no rendering of evil for evil. Evil can be overcome only with good. It would pledge its entire religious, intellectual, moral, physical, industrial, and pecuniary resources to the maintenance of the right education, good conduct, comfortable subsistence, and general welfare of all its population. It would declare and treat all its officers as servants of their brethren, entitled to no other remuneration than an equal subsistence and dividend of general profits with a mass of unofficials. It would know no such thing as government craft and have no separate interests of its functionaries to be fattened at the expense of their constituents. It would disclaim all authority of its own and rest all its legislation, its judicial decrees, and its executive proceedings on their intrinsic rectitude and fitness to promote the public good. It would put off all external display, pomp, parade, and childish insignia, and be a plain, simple business concern, provided with all things decent and convenient for its necessary use, and nothing more. It would incur no expense for distinction's sake, for show and dazzle. Man would make no wicked and foolish attempt to appear a god to his fellow worms. The most exalted servant of the people would need to dwell in no better house, eat no better food, drink no costlier liquids, wear no richer livery, ride in no better carriage, under a wise and righteous government than would be proper for every common citizen. He would be ashamed to wish anything better. He that will be chief among you shall be as he that do, doth serve. This is the pattern for the head of the Christian Republic. Such a government would verify the prophetic prediction, I will also make thy officers peace and thine exactors righteousness. Violence shall be no more heard in thy land, wasting nor destruction within thy borders. Such a government there will yet be throughout the earth. It is coming in the dim, distant future. Christian non-resistance is its forerunner and will hail its arrival amid the welcome shouts of an enlightened world. Men will then look back on our present semi-barbarous governments, much as a philosopher now does on the picture of an Indian sacum, smeared with paint, ornamented with feathers and wampum, and resting on his war club or tomahawk understanding then by human government only divine government, humanized in its forms, applications, and details, non-resistance is decidedly for it, per se. Human government de facto. But is it for human government as it is de facto? This is now the practical question. No. Why not? Because it cannot be both for and against itself. Non-resistance cannot be for war, capital punishment, slavery, and all sorts of penal injury. Nor can it be for any government which is fundamentally for these things. These things are not reconcilable with non-resistance. Its adherents cannot therefore be voluntary participators in existing governments. Not because they are opposed to government per se, but because they are utterly opposed to these fundamental evils, with which all that is good in existing governments is inseparably interwoven. They demand a removal of these anti-Christian articles from our national and state constitutions before they can voluntarily participate in the government. Are they right in assuming this stand? Objection. No, says the objector. You are not clearly right to my apprehension in charging our national and state constitution with being necessarily for war, capital punishment, slavery, and penal injury. But if you are right in this, 
you are positively wrong in refusing to participate in the government till these things are expunged. If you will neither hold office, vote, nor bring actions at law under the government, how do you expect these evils are to be eradicated? You ought to take part in the government, if for nothing else, to effect the necessary amendments in our constitutions. Who is to remove these evils if you, who see and feel them, refuse to lift a finger to dislodge them? Stay in the government and reform it. You frustrate your own aims by non-participation. Answer. War, capital punishment, slavery, and many penal injuries have prevailed in the United States. They still prevail. Are they contrary to the fundamental law? Do they not flourish under its positive sanctions? I shall not go far out of my way to establish facts naked to universal observation. Without meddling with fine-spun arguments designed to show that the federal constitution is an anti-slavery instrument, or anticipating any ingenious plea which might be offered to demonstrate its consonance with Christianity in respect to capital punishment, I shall content myself with presenting an extract from the Constitution of Massachusetts, a state in the vanguard of human improvement, and two or three uh, from that of the United States. These will show whether non-resistance can endorse even Republican constitutions, not to mention the written and unwritten ones of the old world. Extract from the Constitution of Massachusetts. The governor of the Commonwealth, for the time being, shall be the commander-in-chief of the army and navy, and of all the military forces of the state, by sea and land, and shall have full power, by himself or by any commander or other officer and officers, from time to time, to train, instruct, exercise, and govern the militia and navy, and for the special defense and safety of the commonwealth, to assemble in martial array and put in warlike posture the inhabitants thereof, and to lead and conduct them, and with them to encounter, repel, resist, expel, and pursue by force of arms, as well as by sea and by land, within or without the limits of the commonwealth, and also to kill slay, and destroy, if necessary, and conquer by all fitting ways, enterprises, and means whatsoever, all and every such persons, or persons, as shall at any time hereafter in a hostile manner attempt or enterprise the destruction, invasion, detriment, or annoyance of the commonwealth, and to use and exercise over the army and navy, and over the militia in actual service, the law, martial, in time of war and invasion, and also in time of rebellion declared by the legislature to exist, association shall necessarily require. And to take in surprise by all ways and means whatsoever, all and every such person or persons, with their ships, arms, ammunition, and other goods, as shall, in a hostile manner, invade or attempt the invading, conquering, or annoying of this commonwealth and that the governor be entrusted with all these and other powers incident to the offices of captain, general, and commander-in-chief, and admiral, to be exercised agreeably to the rules and regulations of the commonwealth, and the laws of the land, and not otherwise. Extract from the U.S. Constitution The Congress shall have power to define and punish piracies and felonies committed on the high seas, and offenses against the laws of nations, to declare war, grant letters of marquee and reprisal, and make rules concerning capture on land and water, to raise and support armies, to provide and maintain a navy, to provide for calling forth the militia to execute the laws of the Union, suppress insurrections and invasions, to provide for organizing, arming, and disciplining the militia, The President shall be Commander-in-Chief of the Army and Navy of the United States and of the militia of the several states when called into actual service. His oath shall be, I do solemnly swear or affirm that I will faithfully execute the office of President of the United States and will, to the best of my ability, preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. This Constitution and the laws of the United States, which shall be made in pursuance thereof, and all treaties made, or which shall be made, under the authority of the United States, 
shall be the supreme law of the land. These extracts ought to make it clear to every man's apprehension that our state and national constitutions authorize, provide for, and sanction war, preparations for war, and all the abominations incident to our consequent upon the murderous military system. The objector has no ground to stand on here. Why not participate in order to reform? But to come to the second part of the objection, if the non-resistants are right as to the fundamental military and penal character of the government, the objector declares they are positively wrong in refusing to participate in the government till these things are expunged. He wishes to know how or by whom we expect these evils to be eradicated if we will neither hold office, vote, nor bring actions at law. He bids us to stay in the government to reform it and tells us that we frustrate our own aims by non-participation. This will pass current with the mass of people for sound common sense, but I shall show it to be more specious than substantial. If our scruples related solely to minor details and incidental defects in the existing governments, the objector's reasoning would be conclusive, for we do not exact absolute perfection, either theoretical or practical, in constitutions of government as a condition of our participation in them. We can readily conceive of a radically Christian government with minor errors and defects in its details, and certainly with incidental abuses of administration arising out of human imperfection. In such governments, we could conscientiously participate, and should feel bound to do so for the purpose of purifying them entirely, if possible, from errors and abuses. But the governments now under notice are radically, fundamentally anti-Christian. The whole head is sick and the whole heart faint. Military and injurious penal power in their very lifeblood, the stamina of their existence. They are as repugnant to non resistance as pride is to humility, wrath to meekness, vengeance to forgiveness, death to life, destruction to salvation. These constitutions have the double character of de- declarations and covenants. They declare what is to be considered truth and duty, and are a solemn mutual covenant of the people with each other as to what may or shall be done in their name. They are written out with great clearness and precision, so that no one may misunderstand them. When a man assents to them, or swears to support them, or acknowledges himself a party to the compact established by them, they become, to all intents and purposes, declarations of what he regards as truth and duty, and a pledge on his part that he will faithfully cooperate in carrying them into full effect. If they do not declare his sentiments, He makes himself a liar by endorsing, subscribing, or assenting to them. If he does not honestly mean to cooperate in giving them practical efficacy, he perjures himself by solemnly engaging to support the compact. Cannot lie and commit perjury. Am I advised to lie and commit perjury in order to reform an anti-Christian government? If I accept any office of dis- uh, distinction, I must swear or affirm to support the Constitution, not in parts, but entire. In fact, I cannot vote without either actually taking such oath or affirmation, or at least virtually acknowledging myself to be under the highest obligations of allegiance. Government in this country is vested in its voters. They are leagued together by their common declaration of sentiments and mutual covenant, the Constitution, to conduct the government in a certain way, and to maintain its authority by military force. It seems to have been universally taken for granted that military force would be indispensable. It is therefore a gross fraud and imposition for any man to appear at the ballot box as a voter, who is at heart false to the Constitution, who does not mean in good faith to abide by and support it, and just as it is, till it can be constitutionally amended. This is what a non-resistant cannot do, without treason to the divine government, without trampling underfoot the precepts of Jesus Christ. Would the objector have me join an association of persons who covenant that their governor shall be commander-in-chief of the army and navy, and of all their military forces by sea and by land? Whose army, navy, and military forces? Mine? 
Am I a non-resistant in company with a combination who have armies, navies, and military forces? And do I agree that our chief servant shall be commanded these? That he may lead them forth to kill, slay, and destroy our enemies? Am I to vote for such an officer and agree to have him put under oath to do such things? A most exemplary non-resistant indeed. Should I not speedily convince the common mind that I was amazingly opposed to war and all its kindred deeds? Delegated power to declare war. Will the objector insist that I shall proclaim to all the world my assent and agreement as a co-governing citizen of the United States that Congress shall have power to declare war? My representatives have power to do this wicked thing in my name at their discretion. Power to turn the whole nation into impious robbers, murderers, and desolators of the earth. Power to declare all this lawful, just, and right. Power to authorize and preparation of all these crimes and cruelties of war. Never. I will not agree or consent to any such thing. It is an abomination. I will hold office on no such conditions. I will not be a voter on such conditions. I will join no church or state who hold such a creed or prescribe such a covenant for the subscription of their members. Letters of Marquis and Reprisal Piracy Much less will the objector persuade me to authorize any Congress of mine ever to grant those piratical commissions called Letters of Marquis and Reprisal. Defensive war on the home soil to repel murderous invaders, though the most excusable of all war, is forbidden by Christianity. How much more these sevenfold abominations called Letters of Marquis and Reprisal? What are they? Nothing but commissions to unprincipled buccaneers to rob, plunder, and murder defenseless peoples on the high seas. Their victims may be individually the most peaceable and honest people in the world, but if they belong to a certain nation against which, for some foolish or wicked reason, Congress has declared war, their goods are made lawful plunder and themselves the prey of sharkish veracity. Is a common highwayman to be held in universal abhorrence, and hung by the neck on a gibbet, and yet are Christian people to authorize their Congress to grant letters of piracy? And will a man, after agreeing that such things shall be perpetuated in his name, presume to go about preaching peace and non-resistance? Does the objector wish me to make myself supremely ridiculous as well as wicked? And yet notwithstanding all this, I must be a member of the national organization, who are bound by the political creed and covenant. I must be a voter. I must vote for the President of the United States to be commander-in-chief of our army and navy. I must agree to have him put under oath, faithfully to execute this office. I must myself be ready to accept of this, that, and other offices, prefaced by an obligation to support the entire Constitution, war, slavery, and all that, as the supreme law of the land. And if idolatry were a fundamental prescription of the compact, I must support that too. All this for the sake of wielding the necessary influence to reform the government. Unless I lie, perjure myself, and sacrifice every particle of my non-resistant principle for the time being in order to participate in the government as it is, I can never hope to see a Christian government established. I happen to see a more excellent way. Fidelity to principle. Legal and political actions. Many people seem to take for granted that legal and political action affords to good men indispensable instrumentalities for the promotion of moral reform, or at least for the maintenance of wholesome order in society. Hence we hear much said of the duty of enforcing certain penal laws, of voting for just rulers, and of rendering government a terror to evildoers. Now I make no objection to any kind of legal or political action, which is truly Christian action, nor do I deny that some local and temporary good has been done by prosecutions at law, voting in our popular elections, and exercising the functions of magistracy under the prevailing system of human government. But I contend that theirs is very little legal and political action under this system, which is strictly Christian action. 
and I deny that professedly good men do half as much to promote as they do to subvert moral reform and whole, wholesome order in society by legal and political action. The common notions respecting these matters are extremely superficial, delusive, and mischievous. Look at facts. Number one, is it not a fact that men strenuous for legal coercion who devote themselves to the prosecution of lawbreakers as an important duty generally become incapable of benevolent, patient, sussory moral action? Do they not become mere compulsionists? Do they not become disagreeable to humble minds and objects of defiance to the lawless? Is not this generally the case? I'm sure it is. Reliance on injurious penal force costs more than it comes to, as an instrumentality for the promotion of moral reform. It works only a little less mischievously in morale than in religion. Number two. Is it not a fact that equally good men are divided among all the rival political parties, and that under pretense of doing their duty to God and humanity, they vote point blank for and against the same men and measures, mutually thwarting, as far as possible, each other's preferences? Every man knows this. Does God make it their duty to practice this sheer contradiction and hostility of effort at the ballot box? Does enlightened humanity prompt it? No. There must be a cheat somewhere in the game. The Holy Ghost does not blaspheme the Holy Ghost, nor Satan cast out Satan. Either the men are not good, or their notions of duty are false. Number three. Is it not a fact that the most scrupulously moral and circumspect men in all the rival political parties are uniformly found, with very rare exceptions, either among the rank and file of their party or in the inferior offices? Are our wisest and best men of each party put forward as leaders? Are not the managers, the real wire pullers, generally selfish, unscrupulous men? Whatever may be the exceptions, is not this the general rule? We have all seen that it is. How then is it to be accounted for on the supposition that political action is so adapted to moral reform and wholesome order in society? The facts contradict the theory. The good men in political parties are not the leaders, but the led. They do not use political actions to a noble end, but are themselves the dupes and tools of immoral managers, put up or put down, foremost or rearmost, in the center or on the flank, just as they will show and count to the best advantage. All they are wanted for is to shake and count against the same class in the other party. Their use is to give respectability, weight of character, and moral capital to their party. They are the stool pigeons, the decoy ducks, the take-ins of their managers. The way they are used and the game of iniquity played off are the proof of this. Yet this is what many simple souls call having influence. Number four. Is it not a fact that of the very few high-toned moral men who happen to get into the headquarters of political distinction, not one in ten escapes contamination or utter disgust? And now, what do all these facts prove? That under the present system of government, legal and political action is generally anti-Christian that political good men are influential chiefly as tools for mischief, and that non-political good men are the most likely to render legalists and politicians decent in the affairs of government. How to Reform Government Existing governments have their merits. They might be worse than they are. They are as good as the great mass of the people demand or are capable of appreciating. If full-grown Christian constitutions were proffered to them, they would vote them down with contempt. If we could cheat them into the reception of one, they would not know how to live under it. Governments are correct exponents of the aggregate religious light, moral sentiment, and intellectual development of the people living under them. People with a false and low religion, a false and low morality, a low and underdeveloped intellect will have a corresponding false and low organization of society, false and low government. An Esquimax 
Hotentot, or New Hollander, would devise and administer an Esquimax Hotentot, or New Holland government. The reason why we have not a Christian government is that our people are not, in the aggregate, a Christian people. The aggregate religion is far below the Christian standard. The aggregate conscience and moral sentiment of the people is semi-barbarous, and their aggregate intellect is not yet sufficiently improved by knowledge and discipline to see how low their religion and morality is. They are therefore not even ashamed of war and slavery. They do not see that these gross abominations are their disgrace and curse. We have got to enlighten them, expand their intellects, purify their moral sentiment, quicken their consciences, and reform their religious ideas. This is not to be done by voting at the polls, by seeking influential offices in the government, and binding ourselves to anti-Christian political compacts. It is to be done by pure Christian precepts faithfully inculcated, and pure Christian examples on the part of those who have been favored to receive the embrace the highest truths. They must hold up the true standard, let their light shine, and patiently persevere in the great work of creating a new heart and a new spirit in the people. They must do nothing to disparage or hinder whatever is good in the existing order of society and government. Still less must they do anything to hinder their own pure testimony, either by seditious opposition to government or by voluntary participation in its sins. They must not falsify their principles by going with the governments to do evil, nor in going against the wrongs by anti-Christian means, nor by condemning anything in which it is right and good per se. This is the straight and narrow way of Christ. When a considerable portion of the people have been enlightened and won over to Christian non-resistance, the tide of public sentiment will begin to set with such force against war and the whole injury-inflicting system that the less enlightened and less conscientious portion will insensibly yield to the current, and the relics of barbarism, one after another, be cast to the moles and bats. Thus, ultimately, government will be Christianized, and the most scrupulous discipline of the non-resistant Savior feel at liberty to perform any service in it which the public good may require. What a work is to be performed. It has commenced, and will progress much faster than either faint-hearted friends or unbelieving scoffers anticipate though doubtless its consummation is a, at a great distance. In this view of the case, how supremely silly would it appear for a handful of non-resistance to run a tilt of politics and harness themselves to the car of juggernaut in the hope of influencing the besotted multitude to renounce their idolatry. It would be treason to their cause and ridiculous infatuation for them to play such antics. Their mission is to have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them, to teach not number the people, to show forth a model of what ought to be, not conform to what is, to testify against the spiritual wickedness in high places, and to cause the unpopular abominations of the land to be properly appreciated and utterly loathed, to scatter light and call the people to repentance, to reform our 30,000 religious teachers, so that instead of patronizing, inculcating, apologizing for, consenting to, and pronouncing benedictions on military power and display, they may view and speak of it with the same abhorrence they now do idol worship. To convert our hundreds of thousands of church members to this primitive Christianity, which nerved up the ancient disciples to say, in the face of threatened death, I am a Christian and cannot fight, when we have done all this, we will begin to think about voting and accepting office in the government. We believe we shall then no longer be obliged to subscribe constitutions which make our governors and presidents commanders-in-chief of the army, or which invest Congress with discretionary powers to declare war, grant letters of marquee and reprisal, those flagrant crimes against God and humanity. If we should, why then? we would still play our axe to the root of the tree and non-participate till a better day had dawned on the world. Such is the method by which true Christianity teaches its disciples to reform government. True, it is not according to the wisdom of this world, which is foolishness with God, but it is according to the wisdom that cometh down from above, 
which is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, easy to be entreated, full of mercy, and good fruits without partiality and without hypocrisy. James 3.17 Injurious force not essential to government. I shall now be told by the opposer that I am a utopian, a dreamer, a chimerist, to imagine any such thing as a government without a war power in the last resort, without the power of deadly compulsion to suppress individual crime and mobocratic violence. That such a government would be a body without a soul, a house without a foundation, a powerless non-resistant abstraction, a something which can never have existence on earth, at least not so long as human imperfection remains. I know that this is a common objection, respecting government, but it is false, the spawn of ignorance, a sheer delusion. A little reflection will show how utterly groundless it is. It derives all its plausibility from the exhibitions of past and remaining barbarism. Because men have been barbarous, and their laws and penalties barbarous, it is taken for granted that they cannot be otherwise. Just as the African in the center of the torrid zone assumed that there could be no such thing as ice because he had never seen any, and just as all your ignorant people assume that nothing can exist unlike what has come under their own observation. Suppose one should confidently assert that there could be no such thing as a man actually living and transacting business among mankind without a military chapeau on his head, a sword dangling by his side, or a musket over his shoulder, or at least pistols or bowie knife about his person, that no man could live in the world without either actually fighting or threatening to fight, or at least being armed for a fight. Who would not see the absurdity of this assertion? The man and the man's means of preserving his life do not necessarily belong together. The Christian non-resistant is as much of a man as your sword and dagger character, and much less a brute. And the former stands a much better chance of a long life, civil treatment, and substantial happiness in the world than the latter. Suppose someone should assert that there could be no such thing as a family or good family government without guns and dogs to defend them against marauders and plenty of switch sticks to wear up over the children's backs. Would it show anything more than the ignorance and low moral development of the asserter? Suppose another should affirm that there can be no such thing as a church of Christ without the inquisition and the auto de fi. Men of intelligence, reflection, and Christianized moral feeling know the contrary. Under what circumstances the country might have a non-resistant government? Let us have two-thirds of the people of the United States, including that portion who are, or would be thought Christians, philanthropists, people of intelligence, and orderly citizens, once firmly committed to non-resistance, as explained and illustrated in this work, with even a large share of imperfection still lingering about them, and the government might triumphantly dispense with its army, navy, militia, capital punishment, and all manner of infurious inflictions. Under the light necessary to effect so general a change of public sentiment, a considerable portion of the people would have reconstructed neighborhood society by voluntary association in such a manner as nearly to do away in temperance, idleness, debauchery, miseducation, poverty and brutality, and to ensure the requisite inducements, means, and opportunities for great self-improvement and social usefulness. The consequent would be that very few poor creatures would remain without a strong moral guardianship of wise and true friends to look after their welfare. Wholesome cure would be applied with vast success to the ignorant and vicious, and at the same time, powerful preventatives beyond estimation applied to the newborn generation. Under such circumstances, suppose a truly Christian government to administer the general affairs of the several states and of the nation. How little would they have to do? How well might they perform that little? And how trifling would be the burdens of it either to officers or to people? It would hardly require 30 millions of dollars to carry such a government through a single year. 
they would not expand 80%. Of all their receipts on ships of war, forts, arsenals, troops, etc., etc., if they expanded half this sum on the reformation of a few remaining vicious and right education of youth and the encouragement of virtue among the whole people, their work would be cut short in righteousness. If here and there a disorderly individual broke over the bounds of decency, the whole force of renovated public sentiment would surround and press in upon him like the waters of the ocean, and slight, uninjurious force would prevent personal outrage in the most extreme cases. And every day, the causes of such extreme cases would be undergoing the process of annihilation. Meantime, England and the other great nations, between whom and ourselves there is such a frequent and increasing familiarity of intercourse, would vie with ours, not which should have the strongest army and navy and be able to do the most mischief, but which should lead off in the glorious work of reforming, improving, and blessing the human race. Patriotism would then no longer strut in regimentals, recount its ruffian exploits, and provoke quarrels with fellow men for the crime of having been born over sea or on the other side of a mountain or river. It would glory in superior justice, forbearance, meekness, forgiveness, charity, O glorious heirs, I see thee coming to smile on my country and the world. Thou art advancing in silent majesty on the remote verge of this blue horizon. Clouds of dust intervene between thee and the uncouth present. They conceal these from the gaze of the boisterous and bustling multitude. The prophets even can but dimly discern thy beautiful outline, but thou art drawing nearer, Angels are thy heralds, the morning stars are singing together in the train, and the sons of God shout for joy. In due time the heavens shall kiss the earth in thy presence, and the earth shall be restored to the bliss of heaven. View of Present Order of Things and Remedies But we must turn back from this vision and listen again to the scoffs of skepticism the growls of frowning bigotry, and the jargon of Babylon the Great. We must hear those who make the sword, the gibbet, and the dungeon their gods, denounce the doctrines of mercy, and extol the efficacy of cruelty. The world is full of criminals, say they, horrid criminals, ravening like wolves for the prey. And it is presumption to think of trusting to love, mercy, forbearance, and injurious restraints. The wicked must be slain. The unprincipled must be threatened with destruction. The lawless must be held at bay by the terrors of the halter and the cell. Mankind are too depraved to be held and treated as brethren. This is the language of our professedly wise and upright men, in what are falsely supposed to be the first ranks of society. But it is the language of men who need to be born again before they can enter into the kingdom of God. Pharisees and Sadducees, haughty religionists and moralists, who know not their own hearts, nor what manner of spirit they are of. They look not into the cause of crime. They feel not for their fellow creatures, who are born and have lived under the worst possible circumstances. They see not that nine-tenths of the crimes of those whom they glory in bringing to the punishment might have been prevented had good people, so-called, been good enough to care for others beyond the precincts of their own blood relationship. They themselves are great sinners and need great mercy, yet they have little compassion on their fellow sinners of a lower grade. They live in a sort of conventional decency and imagine it to be true morality. They are clothed with the fashionable garments of a superfine selfishness and vainly imagine themselves acceptable to God. They are supremely covetous of this world's goods, and revel in the midst of extravagance, yet think only of the guilt and deserved punishment of thieves and robbers. Let them spare their maledictions against the punishable class of their fellow creatures. Let each one of them seriously ask the following questions. How much better am I by nature than these murderers, robbers, thieves, and wretched culprits whom I so much detest? Had I been born of their parents, been brought up as they were brought up, 
been neglected by the better classes as they were neglected, been tempted as they have been tempted, and been treated as they have been treated, should I have been at this moment what I am? Should I not have been one amongst them, hated and hunted down as a hopeless reprobate? How much attention have I given in my whole life to the consideration of the causes which make one person to differ from another? How much time have I spent in earnest endeavors to prevent my fellow creatures from falling into these crimes, in educating them while children, providing them a good home of industry and comfort in youth, and inducing them in mature age to lead orderly lives? How much thought, how much affection, how much time, how much of my money have I devoted to such purposes? Have I considered these things? Have I brought up my family to consider them? Have I proposed them to my neighbors? Have I brought them before my religious or literary associates? Have I tried by precept, persuasion, an example to unite my friends in preventing pauperism, vice, and crime? Or have I thought chiefly of deterring and punishing crime? Have I been spending nearly all my attention and efforts on myself and my own family to obtain wealth, distinction, fame, self-aggrandizement, and self-indulgence? Have I not been living all this time to myself and for my own little circle of relations and friends? What has my religion done towards making me a Christian after the pattern of Jesus? What has my morality uh, amounted to but worldly decency? And have I not done some things in secret in spite of all my religion and morality, which if known to the world would plunge me into the depths of disgrace? What have I to boast of? Why am I so intent on punishing instead of forgiving and reforming my less fortunate fellow sinners? Would not such a self-examination as this essentially humble and chasten many a self-righteous person? The truth is, if one hundredth part of what the better classes of society now acquire contrary to the law of love and expand on themselves to their positive hurt, were faithfully devoted to the prevention and reformation of crime, scarce an offender would remain in society if no more than what is expended in detecting, trying to punish criminals, were judiciously applied to the work of prevention and reformation. It would accomplish ten times more for society than it now does. But alas, as undertakers live and flourish by burying the dead, so there are not a few in the present organization of society who live by hunting and punishing criminals. And yet, many of the worst offenders luxuriate in perfect impunity, fortified by bulwarks impregnable to the penal laws. At the same time, the ordinary acquisition of property, by what are called the better classes, the criers out for a punishment, is only a fashionable species of gambling and extortion in which the cunning, the fortunate, and the unscrupulous carry off the stakes amid the perpetual grumblings of the unlucky losers. Besides this, intemperance and licentiousness are permitted to allure millions through their licensed portals at the chambers of hell, and slavery shakes her whips and chains over a sixth portion of a professedly free people, under the protection of our star-spangled banner. Is it any wonder that such a state of things, such a religion, such a morality, such unbridled acquisitiveness, such selfishness, and such oppression of the governing portion should breed, foster, and perpetuate all manner of vice and crime in the underclasses of society? Not at all. Therefore, Christian non-resistance protests against the wickedness of the punishing, as well as the punished classes. It proposes and insists on a radical reform. And when this reform shall have gone forward to a certain point, a government, untainted by military power or penal injury, will be both practicable and certain. To show that such a government is possible, I will now present a clear, discriminating, irrefutable ex- extract from M. Guizat, Prime Minister of France. Extract from Guizot's letter. Is it not forming a gross and degrading idea of government to suppose that it resides only to suppose that it resides chiefly in the force which it exercises to make itself obeyed in its coercive elements. Let us quit religion for a moment and turn to civil government. Trace with me, I beseech you, 
the simple march of circumstances. Society exists. Something is to be done no matter what, in its name and for its interest. A law has to be executed, some measure to be adopted, a judgment to be pronounced. Now, certainly, there is a proper method of supplying these social wants. There is a proper law to make, a proper measure to adopt, a proper judgment to pronounce. Whatever may be the matter in hand, whatever may be the interest in question, there is, upon every occasion, a truth which must be discovered and which ought to decide the matter and govern the conduct to be adopted. The first business of government is to seek this truth. It is to discover what is just, reasonable, and suitable to society. When this is found, it is proclaimed. The next business is to introduce it to the public mind, to get it approved by the men upon whom it is to act, to persuade them that it is reasonable. In all this, is there anything coercive? Not at all. Suppose now that the truth which ought to decide upon the affair, no matter what, suppose I say that the truth being found and proclaimed, all understandings should be at once convinced, all wills at once determined, and all should acknowledge that the government was right and obey it spontaneously. There's nothing yet of compulsion, no occasion for the employment of force. Does it follow, then, that a government does not exist? Is there nothing of government in all this? To be sure, there is, and it has accomplished its task. Compulsion appears not till the resistance of individuals calls for it, till the idea, the decision which authority has adopted, fails to obtain the approbation or the voluntary submission of all. Then government employs force to make itself obeyed. This is a necessary consequence of human imperfection, an imperfection which resides as well in power as in society. There is no way of entirely avoiding this. Civil governments will always be obliged to have recourse, in a certain degree, to compulsion. Still, it is evident they are not made up of compulsion, because whenever they can, they are glad to do it without it, to the great blessing of all. And their highest point of perfection is to be able to discard it, and trust to means purely moral to their influence upon the understanding, so that in proportion as government can dispense with compulsion and force, the more faithful it is in its true nature, and the better it fulfills the purpose for which it is sent. This is not to shrink, this is not to give way, as people commonly cry out. It is merely acting in a different manner, in a manner more general and powerful. Those governments which employ the most compulsion perform much less than those which scarcely ever have resource recourse to it. Government, by addressing itself to the understanding, by engaging the free will of its subjects, by acting by means purely intellectual instead of contracting, expands and elevates itself. It is then that it accomplishes most and attains to the greatest objects. On the contrary, it is when a government is obliged to be constantly employing its physical arm that it becomes weak and restrained that it does little and does that little badly. The essence of government, then, by no means resides in compulsion, in the exercise of brute force. It consists more especially of a system of means and powers conceived for the purpose of discovering upon all occasions what is best to be done for the purpose of discovering the truth which by right ought to govern society, for the purpose of persuading all men to acknowledge this truth, to adopt and respect it willingly and freely. Thus I think I have shown that the necessity for and the existence of government are very conceivable, even though there should be no room for compulsion, even though it should be absolutely forbidden. From the History of Civilization in Europe, Lecture 5. Conclusion Is this satisfactory? Is this conclusive? It ought to be so. It is not the language of a non-resistant enthusiast, a utopian dreamer, but of Monsieur Guiza, an intelligent and accomplished prime minister of Louis Philippe. Let the arrogant condemners of this idea of a pure Christian government resolve the matter and consider whether their skepticism arises out of knowledge or ignorance. To a sound mind, the case admits of little doubt. 
The great prerequisites to this establishment of such a government has already been pointed out. It is religious, moral, and intellectual reform among the people, superinducing in them a more Christian faith, a more Christian conscience, a more enlightened intellect, and a purer morality. This noble work non-resistance espouses and will unfalteringly prosecute is to its blessed consummation. To carry it forward, the faithful will lay aside pecuniary, political, military, and all worldly ambition, every weight that encumbers, and press forward to the mark for the prize of the high calling in Jesus Christ. Despising the cross and enduring the shame, till they enter into his glory and partake of the true majesty of this kingdom. He is King of kings, the Lord of lords, and the kingdoms of this world shall at length become his in righteousness and peace. I have thought it gentle and ungentle hour of many an act and giant shape of power, of bruised rights and flourishing bad men, and virtue wasting heavenwards from a den, brute force and fury and the devilish drouth, of the fool cannon's ever gaping mouth, and the bride widowing sword and the harsh bray, the steering trumpet sends across the fray, and all which blights the people thinning star, the selfishness invokes the horsed war. Panting along with many a bloody mane, I have thought of all this pride and all this pain, and all the insolent plenitudes of power, and I declare by this most quiet hour that power itself has not one half the might of gentleness. Tis want to all true wealth. The uneasy madman's force to the wise health, blind downward beating to the eye that see, noise to persuasion, doubt to certainty, the consciousness of strength in enemies, who must be strained upon or else they rise. Whereas all shrieks and clangs with which a sphere undone and fired could rake the midnight sky, compared with that vast dumbness nature keeps throughout her starry deeps most old and mild and awful and unbroken, which tells a tale of peace beyond what e'er was spoken. Lee Hunt All right, so a number of things that I want to pull out here from uh, the final chapter of Balu's work. First, something that... Um, that if you've listened to this podcast for um, for a while, you've heard me mention it a number of times. But Balu, I think, points out really well at, the, at both the beginning and the end. Um, at, at the first part, Balu points out that um, you know he's he's basically saying that uh, you know a big part of this nonviolence aspect is um, not just not killing people not just this this negative justice, right, avoiding negative justice, but it's really the doing of positive justice. So in the beginning, he points out a lot of how how greed uh, and self-interest are are problems in government and and really cause a lot of the the um, the violence. Um, and then at the end, he gets into it quite a, a bit deeper, and he's like, "Look, I mean, people in society, do you ever consider why 90% of the, the, quote, bad people are bad? Like, why do they make the decisions they make? And what have you really done? Like, have, have you really done your uh, positive justice Christian duty? Have you really reached out to them? In the beginning of his work, uh, of this chapter, he's talking about uh, government officials, you know, not driving better car, well, not cars, but, you know, buggies, um, not drinking expensive liquids and having these feasts and things. He's like, look, government officials, they set themselves up as this, this other class that enjoys all these things while their constituency, a portion of them, suffers. He's like, that's just, that's wicked. That's not Christian. And then at the end, he's like, okay, so there are people who do bad things, but why do many of them do the bad things that they do? It's probably because they were raised a particular way by bad, negligent parents. They um, came into want because of poverty or because people are taking advantage of them. And in large part because we're not doing our positive justice. 
as individuals, as Christians, but then the government's not doing positive justice because what is the government spending its money on? By and large, warfare. Um, and, and you see this uh, also in, you know, Dwight Eisenhower had, had this famous speech where he says, you know, every, whatever, like every uh, bomber airplane is like 10 schools, whatever he says. His point is, um, look, a, a decision to spend money on military is a decision to not do positive justice. Uh, and that's a double whammy for a Christian because not only are we not doing positive justice, but then what we are spending our money on is either self, self-interest or negative justice, right? We're, we're going and we're killing people uh, through warfare. So it's a double whammy for Christians, which, which Balu points out. And we have talked throughout the seasons how it's interesting for, for me personally. I came to nonviolence through a dissonance that was created by my exposure to working with the poor. And working with the poor, I realized I am not like Jesus. Jesus was radical. And when I realized that Jesus was radical and my life was not in regards to positive justice and poverty, you know, if, if I'm really supposed to give to the beggar, maybe I really am supposed to forgive my enemies. Maybe I really am supposed to love them too. Maybe I am supposed to do good to them. Uh, maybe I am supposed to turn the other cheek. All those things um, but come into view. And most of us aren't going to go and fight in a war or um, have, have dealings with violence face to face. But we do get opportunities, with more frequency at least, to come face to face with those in need, uh, with the poor. And I think um, seeing the poor, working with the poor, coming in contact with that experience is a gateway for accepting Jesus. And it, it makes sense. I mean, like, look at his Beatitudes and, and the way that he talks about the, the poor and the outcast. You know, theirs is, theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And um, when you come in contact with those people, you come in contact with the kingdom of heaven and you get the choice to either take it or leave it. You know, am I really, do I really want to be in the kingdom of heaven because the kingdom of heaven is such as these? Do I want to be in with a bunch of poor people and kids if that's what the kingdom of heaven is like? Am I willing to humble myself and accept that? So it's really not surprising to me that kind of at the culmination of Balu's book, poverty um, and positive justice are, are a part of it. So sure, his book is about why we shouldn't participate in negative justice, but a huge, huge aspect of that is going to be, yeah, because the Christian kingdom provides an alternative. We are a kingdom that does positive justice. Um, And when we do positive justice, we have less of a a felt need for negative justice um, because it not only is it just better and it's the way that God created it to work, but also, like, don't you think it's a little bit more efficient to do positive justice? It might be hard at first to forgive a murderer Maybe you think that he's going to go out and murder somebody else, and maybe he will. But as we start to do positive justice, we create less victims and we, we cut off a cycle of violence. And that might involve us eating the cost at first, initially, and, um, and, and having to deal with that. But long term, it's, it's more effective, too, because we, we build people up. I know that they're doing this in, in uh, different communities, like with gangs and, and trying to have mediators and interventions. And there are lots of peacemakers doing, doing great work uh, across the world trying to, to facilitate this type of thing. Another thing that stood out in this section was it reminded me of uh, when we talked about our individual self-defense. You know, what would you do if somebody comes into your home to harm you? And uh, John Howard Yoder has, has a book called What Would You Do? in which he highlights something that I think Balu hits on perfectly right here too, where Yoder basically says, hey, look, you, you really don't care about, um, you know, about self-defense because, and I'll use a more modern war because Yoder uses the Vietnam War since that, that's what he's writing in, but he's like, look, when your military goes goes over and uh, and kills a bunch of civilians, which that's what our military does, like they kill a lot of civilians, not saying on purpose, but 
it happens, right? Yoder's like, you're not really fighting for them. You you say, well, that's just kind of collateral damage. It happens in in warfare. That's just kind of reality. And um, that but we've got to do it because that's the right thing. We got to go to war with this country. And Yoder's like, you don't you don't care about self defense. You don't you don't care about those other people who are dying at the hands of aggression. What the reason you want to maintain self defense is because you want defense for your family, like for your things. You want to protect your things. Um, and, and really Yoder boils it down to, um, being self-defense is largely about self-interest. Sure. We don't want our family to die. Get that. But we're okay with the, the Afghani collateral damage. We're okay with the, uh, with the Vietnamese collateral damage. But if, um, doing the right thing means not killing somebody else or attacking somebody else, including an aggressor. Um, we're not okay with our family being collateral damage for doing the right thing. And that's a, a big simplification. Um, you should go back and listen to that episode if you want it kind of hashed out more. And, and I think I quote Yoder, but um, self-interest is, is a huge part of, of this discussion when it comes to, um, to violence because a lot of violence is a result of our selfishness and, and self-focus hoarding resources, greed, uh, protecting those resources, all that kind of stuff. Um, and so you find that quite often poverty and, and social justice are inextricably linked with the idea of, of violence, nonviolence. Why do we go to wars? Why do we kill? Why do we have harsh sentences? A lot of times when you really dig into it, it's... it's um, self-protection, protection of the, the ruling class or the um, tyranny of the majority if you're in a democracy. The second thing I would highlight here from, from Balu's last section is um, I, I think he hits the nail on the head when because for government, a lot of people have a really big issue with this idea of not voting. Like, well, what do you expect? Like, you know, he's, he's a commander-in-chief, not a pastor-in-chief. We can't expect our government to be perfect. And Balu really hammers home that. Um, like, basically, if, if you vote and if you involve yourself in government, you are agreeing to promote the things that the Constitution, state or, or uh, federal, the things that that says. And so what does it say? Um, it says that, you know, you're, you're voting for a commander in chief, you're voting for somebody to go to war, to be in charge of militias, to exact punishment, like all these things. And so whatever the government does that's constitutional, they do in your name. Now, sure, if somebody gets in government and, and does something illegal or unconstitutional, you didn't elect them to do that. So that's not done in your name. You, you, there are imperfect people and they do bad things. You're not responsible for that. But for the things that they do under the Constitution, you are responsible for. If you voted for one of the presidents that was uh, that participated in the war in Afghanistan, which I did, I voted for uh, you know, Bush the first time, and I think I voted for him the second time, and then um, – Whatever. I, I voted in all the elections up through 2016. I didn't vote in the, the last one, 2020, whatever that was. Um, I, I gave them free reign to do what they did. The civilian deaths, um, well, as well as the, the Yemeni children who are starving, the, the Yemeni people who are starving, um, because my government is in league with Saudi Arabia and propping them up. I, I have culpability in those events because I gave my government permission to use my name to do whatever they did that was constitutional. I have blood on my hands. Um, and that, that's serious. So, uh, and, and Balu says, well, if you're just, if you're nonviolent and you try to go through the government and say, well, you know, I'm really nonviolent, but I'm, I'm going to vote so I can get on the inside and then, um, and disrupt it from the inside and, and vote for nonviolent things. He's like, well, then you're just a liar because you, you say that you're agreeing with these things, but really, you don't. 
So um, you either have to be a perjurer or you have to be complicit with what the state does. Um, and Balu, you know, shows us that, well, what, what really needs to happen is we need to not support those things. And sure, it's idealistic to think that tomorrow we're going to have the vast majority of the American public who is, is uh, practicing Christians who are doing positive justice and w- refuse to do violence. Yeah, it's not going to happen tomorrow. But it's not going to happen at all if um, if people don't change and make Christ their king. And so our job is not to um, to worry so much about the practicality of things, but to to um, do what's right, to be faithful. So I just love how Balu so well shows that um, you know the the logic, the moral logic of participation. In, in governmental system. Now, if you're not nonviolent, it probably doesn't weigh on you nearly as much um, as it does if, if you are nonviolent. I personally, I don't see how you can um, morally, logically, philosophically adhere to nonviolence and not be a Christian anarchist. That's very difficult for me to see. I don't understand how you can um, participate in government as it is any government in the world, I think any national government in the world, I don't know how you can participate in it and um, and be consistently nonviolent. If you're not for nonviolence, I still think, I mean, the, the government does so many objectively bad things that are constitutional. Um, I, I just don't know how you can still justify that, even if you are for violence and, and um, the penal system and things. Um, but I, I guess I could see that a little bit more. So anyway, that uh, that wraps up our time with Balu. Love this work. I, it's one that I'm going to read probably at least once a year. Uh, this is like my second or third time reading through it, and um, I'm more more amazed at it this time on my third reading than I was on my first or second. Uh, it's just such a good work, and he, it, it's um, it's relatively short but it's got so much jam packed into it and it's great. So I hope you guys enjoyed it. That's all for now. So peace. And because I'm a pacifist, when I say it, I mean it. This podcast is a part of the Kingdom Outpost Network. Please check out the links below to find other great podcasts and content related to nonviolence and kingdom living.